Hi, I'm Corina Becco, the writer of The Space Between, The Expanse, Avatar Adop Adapter Die, and Green Lantern Earth One, and welcome to the roost. Hello, 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 and welcome to another episode of Rapid Fire with the Roost here live from Blackbird Comics and Coffee House in beautiful Maitland, Florida. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and get into it. You guys don't come here to see me or listen to me. Uh, today's guest, I'm actually, it's, it's a book that I've already read and I love the space between. I've brought on writer Karina Becco and she is right here. Karina, how are you? Very good. Thank you. <laughs> so uh, I have loved the book. I know Aaron was reading it as well. The space between um, the solicitation for this book is what sold me, to be fair. Uh, whoever wrote that solicitation for issue one did a phenomenal job. They're very good at Boom. <laughs> yes, yes. And we love Boom here. Uh, everybody over there is phenomenal. Um, but yeah, we'll jump We'll jump right into it with uh, Rapid Fire with the Roost. Um, my first question always, 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 always is, what is your comic book origin story? What essentially started you on the path of wanting to become a comic writer, comic creator? Uh, how did that story come about? I've always felt like comics are just sort of magic, like something happens when you have a story and the art and it just it creates this third thing that is unlike any other format. So my very first um, book is called Heathen Town, and I am also from Florida, so I'm very happy to speak to you in Florida. And it was a horror story um, set in the Everglades. So uh, after that, I was just totally hooked because that was something that could not exist in another format than comics. That is, that is awesome. I love how everybody has a different origin story to how they got into the business, you know, and uh, there is no right or wrong way. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, the book is The Space Between. Uh, go, what can readers, uh, I've read the first issue, but let's just say somebody has not read it yet. They're, they're thinking about picking it up on the shelf. What can readers expect from the space between it? And, and what kind of story would you say you're trying to tell here? Um, it's really, uh, it's science fiction. There's some romance. Uh, it's a lot, um, my background is from science, um, but more the biological sciences. So there's a lot of cats and dogs and uh, geckos and creatures, but it's really a story more about um, what happens in between um, getting from one place to another. In this case, we're going from the Earth over many generations to another planet. And each issue, instead of being continuing the story of one group of people, it's the same group of people, but different generations. So every issue, there's a new revolution, there's a new romance. Things have changed, but we feel all of, of the decisions that the people made along the way. And, and to be fair, that was what um, about the solicitation intrigued me. And, and it actually leads into my next question. Um, as you mentioned, it's it's kind of telling the story of this, this journey of all these people uh, in the spaceship and everything like that. And, and how do you approach telling a story that's broken up, broken up not just amongst months, months, years, or even uh, decades, but kind of centuries? <laughs> You know, it, it was, this was a real challenge to write. Um, I had the idea and I had the pitch and the way I work, I kind of, um, I go from the big picture down to the smaller. And once I got down to actually how this would work for a little bit, I was kind of like, oh, what have I gotten myself into? But then I realized there's all this space, literal space and figurative space to um, really explore these issues. And again, I think this comes down to comics. You can do this in comics. I think this would have been a very, very challenging novel to write, but in comics, because Danny Lockhart, the artist on the book is so amazing and expressive. Um, I threw him some things that were just like, okay, we're gonna jump a hundred years. And he's like, okay, let's make it happen. <laughs> So you mentioned you have a science background. Um, what were some of the sci-fi or real life or science fiction uh, 
influences that you kind of uh, chimed into while writing this book? Because I feel like in, in small pieces, I see lots of little bits of popular sci-fi that we've probably seen all culminating into this original story that you have. What influences did you have while writing this or while pitching this? Oh, gosh, yeah. Um, it's funny, though. The thing I had done with Boom before this was The Expanse. And I do love The Expanse. Um, I also love a lot of uh, writers like Ursula K. Le Guin or uh, Tip Tree and like earlier, like mid-century-ish writers that did a lot of stuff with um, like with politics mixed into the uh, very human stories. I really like that. But I also really like, um, uh, well, I like Cronenberg a lot. That's a lot more horror tinged, but also very sci-fi. So there was a lot of all of these things in, in my mix. I work at a museum, so I also uh, think a lot about history and um, how these ideas from the past affect how we look at things in the future. And, and uh, we mentioned earlier the solicitation for the book. You mentioned about how the book takes takes place across so much time. How do you approach uh, writing multiple different main characters? Kind of obviously in the first issue we have our kind of two main characters, but it's it seems obvious to me, and you can correct me if I'm wrong. Again, I haven't seen issue two yet, but it seems like we will quickly move on from these people as we move on across generation to generation. Yeah, absolutely. Um, we're going to get a little bit of overlap occasionally, um, but not a ton. So we're going to be introducing new new characters each time, which in a way it was freeing because, oh, I get to deal with a whole lot of characters and a much wider range of people than would normally be possible in a miniseries. But at the same time, I quickly realized, oh, gosh, I am inventing out of whole cloth new characters every single time. Because in a normal um, situation like this, well, you introduce everybody and you get them up on their feet and then they get to run and use that the rest of the, the plot to unveil what they're doing and you get an understanding of that. But in this, it's more like it's a new story each time. So um, that I had to do a lot of sort of prep work behind the scenes. I don't think you'll see it a lot on the page exactly but i hope it comes through in fully fleshed characters each time uh in, in this first issue and, and the cover kind of kind of tells it uh in the name of the book almost in a way too but you do a good job of balancing a sci-fi story a pure sci-fi story with a little bit of like a love romance uh how did you manage to to juggle those and, and to approach those and kind of not make it feel like just one it does not feel like a pure romance book and it, it doesn't just feel like a pure sci-fi book how did you balance that oh thank you thank you for the kind words i really appreciate that and i really hoped that was what would happen i feel like um science fiction if it's good science fiction it has to really be about the people the people are so important because the decisions they make, uh, the technology doesn't ultimately matter. And whether it's used for good or for ill is only about the people. So I tried to really think about uh, a, a lot about the tech and I did a lot of research about how um, societies would function in space. And there, I read a lot of philosophy about this. And then I tried to forget all of that and just keep it on the back burner. And really just think of these people as people and think, okay, I know what the world is. How would these people react to this world? That's great. Uh, I, and, and honestly, I can't wait. Um, I, I, I No spoilers. When I got to the last page um, and I saw, you know, the, the, everything that kind of happens there by the end, uh, I smiled because having read the solicit, I'm like, ooh, I have a small feeling I know where, what is gonna like when I say what's gonna happen next not like the whole story but like the very beginning of what issue two might be with the introduction of some some things there at the end um, but I love what you were able to do uh it met and exceeded all expectations I had from the solicitation to be fair <laughs> oh thank you so much and I will say that I don't always um underline exactly who is related to who in what way but um there are characters in the second one that if you have read closely the first one, you will basically know some parentage and uh, who's related and where those, um, why they have turned out to have some of the ideas that they have. 
that's that's great and it's what i wanted it's what i uh nobody has quite i'm sure people have thought of this but nobody has actually ever put it down on paper or screen to adapt something like this i mean we get space exploration and space tourism style stories all the time but nobody's ever tried to tell it over the course of generations and centuries and things like that which i think is very unique and very awesome oh thank you yeah i've always felt like that was really missing from generation ship like i i love the idea of it but it seems so um, fruitful to think of a closed society and what would actually happen. And I'm hoping uh, a lot of people respond to this because I would sure love to write more of that. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, we've talked a lot about the space between. You've definitely done some creator creator owned stuff, uh, but you've also worked on IP. You did the Green Lantern Earth One, which Aaron said he, he loved. <laughs> um, you, you also worked on Avatar. Um, which is as big as an IP as you can kind of get in the modern day. Um, and, and then you've worked on creator own. Are there differences to how you approach writing and scripting and doing those things? Or do you still, is it just writing at the end of the day and you kind of approach it the same way? You know, it is, it is different for me because I approach anything I do that is someone else's um, sandbox as I try to be very respectful and really think about, um, the feeling that they were trying to convey. I mean, the world is very important and the details are important, but I feel like the feeling like uh, I co-wrote some Star Wars a while back and I felt like what makes Star Wars Star Wars, no matter what kind of aliens or what you're seeing, what the droids look like. And uh, I feel like that's very important. It's not necessarily always what I would first think of writing. So I try to honor that. Whereas when I'm writing for myself, it's all, okay, what story do I personally feel really passionately about? So either way, I only um, take jobs where I really like whatever it is, like Green Lantern or um, Star Wars. Of course, everyone loves Star Wars, but I do love Star Wars. I love Star Trek, uh, all of these sci-fi things. Um, I only take the ones that I really feel like I understand intrinsically. But then when I'm writing my own uh, thing, like The Space Between, it's something where I feel like, I really understand the story and I can bring something unique to it that I couldn't bring to something else that I'm writing for someone else. So, uh, you know, I totally realized when I opened up, I didn't ask, um, how many issues are we expecting? Like how, how long are you planning for this story? What, what has boom mentioned to you that they're expecting from this? Is it a mini? Is it a maxi? How, how do you plan on playing this one out? <laughs> it is a mini. It's, it's uh, four issues. Um, you know, I would love to do a second uh, volume if there's the the interest and that is in the cards. Um, but yeah, right now it's four issues and uh, it will get us quite a ways along this journey. So, Well, that's good to hear, right? It's like usually four issues like, oh, not enough. But I'm like, I am intrigued. I actually feel like this is uh, semi a challenge to be able to fit as yeah. much well well wrapped into four issues just because it's not just a uh, four days in the life or four months in the life or even four years in the life this is this is going to take some time <laughs> oh yes it's uh we will cover um decades upon decades upon decades so uh a lot of um things will change and uh hopefully if people stick with it from issue one to issue four they can chart where these things have gone who has sort of passed into legend and how things have changed I, I like it. You're making your own, literally like your own world here, which is great because the yes. world, the world of the ship, that is the new, you know, like, let's just forget about Earth. The ship is the planet, you know, and everything like that. And I love it. Exactly. That's, uh, I mean, that's where they're, they're home they're, and they can't leave it. It's, uh, they're, they're kind of stuck. They didn't choose it. So I think that's a really interesting thing about generation ships. Um, but it's true for us too, right? I mean, you don't necessarily choose anything about how you end up in life, but there you are and you have to work with that. So, so um, before I kind of let you let everybody know where you're at on, on the internet and everything, we always have a bonus question that we like to to throw out there. It is a little ridiculous and feel free to take okay. your time thinking of it. With your background, I feel like this will work. <laughs> so let me read it as it is. <laughs> we fast okay. forward to the future, and we are suddenly in the midst of a post-apocalyptic scenario. 
what skill set or unknown ability do you have that would be beneficial for our post-apocalyptic survival team? You know, I have thought a lot about this. Um, my day job, I'm a fossil preparator. And a lot of that during the summers involves field work where I go out and it's very primitive camping, um, digging up fossils. Uh, digging up fossils would not be good for a post-apocalyptic future, but um, camping, uh, being able to uh, know how to get water that is not um, you know, toxic. I also know a little bit about things like beekeeping. I have worked as a wildlife um, uh, in a wildlife hospital. I, so I know how to do um, first aid for animals at least, which I'm assuming, you know, you probably don't want me to bandage up your cut, but I could. <laughs> and I know a little bit about um, animal behavior as well, because I do have a background in zoology. So I think I would be a very good addition to anyone's post-apocalyptic team. That, that is awesome. You're on the team and it's very different <laughs> than you. what Steve Fox told us in our last one. Steve was very <laughs> honest and he told us he'd just, he'd be the first one to perish. He's like, I have no skills and I would just, I would just be the first to go. And I'm like, that's great. Cause half of the other people that have no skills just said, well, I'd make a good bard. I'd be a storyteller. I'd write the script. I'm like, yeah, we're all comic writers. Obviously everybody's right. going to write the script. <laughs> Right. Yeah, I figured, you know, that's probably way down the list of what we actually need in this scenario. <laughs> I mean, sure, we need one, right? But once I get to four bards, uh, I, I just, I don't know if we can tell the story any more ways. That's a bard-heavy team, yeah. <laughs> it is. We, we need we need some, some barbarians. We need some, you know, we need uh, people that can live off the land. <laughs> right, exactly. So, so um, let people know uh, where they can find you. Uh, you know, let the, are you on social media? How can fans interact with you or follow up? Do you have a newsletter? I know you have a website. Just let people know where they can follow you. Yeah, I've been really bad about my website. It really needs to be updated. But everywhere else, I am Corina Becco. So spelled just like that at every place that I am. So I know everything's so diffuse right now. I'm not on... Um, uh, the site formerly known as Twitter as much anymore, but I'm on Blue Sky, Instagram a lot, um, even Facebook, uh, even Spoutable. <laughs> like I'm all over the place, but uh, Patreon. And it's always Corina Becco because I am fortunate not too many people have that name. So it never gets uh, taken. So. <laughs> So you mentioned Patreon, and I want to let you kind of uh, pitch that. Uh, what can people expect from your Patreon? Is, do you use that more as a newsletter? Is there content in there that's exclusive to that? How? What can people expect there? Yeah, um, I actually have been experimenting with putting up uh, chapters of a novel I'm working on there. I have some older stories, some short stories and stuff, some comics, um, some just ramblings about uh, what I think about um, writing and uh, my writing process. I really try to update it every week. Um, honestly, if I'm in the field or something, it doesn't happen because I don't have internet and I'm super afraid to bring my laptop to where it's 112 degrees. So um, it gets updated uh, as often as I can, so. Well, that's awesome. Yeah, I don't know if everyone knows about Patreon, but I think that's a great uh, tool for creators to use uh, to interact with their fans, especially when social media sometimes becomes a little divisive. <laughs> yes, exactly. It's been a rough, a rough year for getting the word out about things. So thank you so much for um, reading the book and for having me on the show, because it's it's a struggle out there right now, honestly. <laughs> There's a lot of content, but it's why we love doing the show and we love to spotlight, you know, great things that we're enjoying. You know, there's uh, three of us working on the comic side, roughly. There's the owners and everybody likes something different. So we really love to be able to spotlight what we're enjoying um, because, you know, you can't spotlight everything. But as much as we can, uh, we, we like to try to do that. <laughs> That's fantastic. And there's nothing I love more than a shop with uh, actually curated stuff where the, the folks that work there can tell you what you don't know that you want to read. I love that. So thank you. <laughs> Absolutely. So 
Karina, thank you so much for your time. Thank you for coming on the show today. Uh, we love having uh, independent creators like yourself on here. Uh, it's just so much fun to hear about the worlds you're building and the playgrounds you're playing in. Oh, thank you so much for having me on. I um, I apologize for how dark it is in my little cave here, but uh, it's been such a pleasure to talk to you. No, it is totally fine. And so again, guys, she is Karina Becco, the writer, author of The Space Between. Uh, it is a phenomenal book if you love sci-fi, uh, if you love a little bit of romance. Uh, I, I personally think if you like Star Wars, especially if you like Han and Leia, even though that's not where you're going, but it, it, I loved it because of, of some of that. I felt like I felt like I, I saw some of that uh, like trash compactors love from uh, <laughs> oh, yeah. uh, them. So, but I love it. It's a phenomenal book, that. guys. Uh, <laughs> we still have copies of number one in the store. I do believe I saw that a second print just recently hit FOC and then number two should be right at the end of the month. So we are very excited for that. Oh, terrific. Yes. I, I can't wait to have that uh, second printing out too. That's going to be a really fun cover. Yes. And it's a big milestone. Anytime uh, you guys, you can get a book, you know, sold out distribution and go to a second print. That is huge. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I'm very thankful to everyone who's been picking it up and reading it. So thank you so much for your time, Karina. Thank you for joining us here at Blackbird on Rapid Fire with the Roost. And again, everybody, pick it up, the space between. I promise you, you won't regret it, especially if you love any type of sci-fi space exploration. Uh, it, it is just up your alley. Uh, Karina, thank you so much for joining us tonight. Uh, thank you. I really appreciate this. And it was great to talk to you. Thank you, and we'll see y'all at the next Rapid Fire with the Roost. Take it easy. <laughs>